Hi, I'm Professor Wayne Miller, and this video is a brief introduction to the study of indigenous religions. Now, what are indigenous religions? Indigenous religions means the religions of a particular tribe or group of people in a particular place. It, it means sort of the opposite of world religions like Judaism or Christianity or Islam or, you know, huge religions. Indigenous religions are referring to, you know, tribal groups, whether it could be in China or Australia or the plains of America or, or wherever it may be. But most of these smaller sort of clan-sized religions grew out of tribes where people were very close to the earth, very close to nature. In fact, they had to be. Most of these religions grew in a pre-industrialized world. Their relationship to nature was very important for their survival. So most in what has become known as indigenous religions have a animistic view of the world. They believe that God and spirits dwell in the world around us. In, and there are specific spirits sometimes that dwell in a particular location, a tree, a rock, a mountain, a river. <clears throat> and it's very important to show proper deference and respect for the world around us. If we don't show respect for the creation around us, then we can get into a lot of trouble. Uh, if we pollute our rivers or over hunt, over fish and wipe out what is around us, it would it, we would lose our source of sustenance. I'll give you an example. Uh, the Plains Indians, the, the, the Native Americans who lived in the Plains of America, they hunted for deer and buffalo and other things to provide nourishment for their tribe, but also the skins and everything else were used in a number of ways to provide the clothing and everything else for their people. However, when the Easterners, the Europeans and the Easterners, took train rides when the Continental Railroad was finished and they came across the plains and railroads, they would actually stop and get out with guns and then start shooting buffalo indiscriminately. When they saw a huge herd of buffalo, they would just kill them, maybe kill them all, and just leave their bodies to rot on the plains. To the Native Americans, this was a sacrilege. This was insane. You can't do that and expect these animals to be there tomorrow. They won't be there. They'll be dead. So we came very close to wiping out. Industrialized people came very close to wiping out the American bison and buffalo. The, for the Native Americans, this was unthinkable. You needed to respect the world around you. Um, so one of the things that's very interesting about indigenous religions is that the relationship between the natural and the supernatural, between the human and the non-human, those divides are very hard to find because tribal people believed that everything was alive and that the gods could appear at any time in any place. So in one sense, uh, there's not this huge separation that we find today in people's minds between the, the, the normal world and the sacred world or the divine world. So one of the things you find in tribal re indigenous religions is that there is a tremendous reverence for the origin. Uh, in fact, if we talk, to, to understand this better, you should probably read Mercia Eliade and his book, The Myth of the Eternal Return, or his other book on the sacred and the profane. He talks about the fact that for tribal religions, most of them believe in origins, that the origin is the most important thing. In, in the beginning, in that time of creation, the gods were very active in this world. And what they did had amazing, you know, well, they created the world, they created the human beings, they created everything. And that time and that event was you know, cataclysmic. And we exist today because of what the gods did. So most of these tribal religions do not see 
time as linear as be coming starting from yesterday and going to tomorrow, but as the cycle. And the cycle could be a month or it could be a year, but at some point the cycle will end, and it needs to be reborn. So indigenous religions actually have ceremonies, rituals that they perform periodically, uh, say at, at New Year's time, where there's a kind of a death and rebirth ritual where those events related to the creation of the universe are reenacted. And you're not just commemorating, but you're participating in the recreation of your own world. You're also participating in the recreation of the time cycle. So you begin a new year. Again, you're not just commemorating a new year. You're actually creating the new cycle of time and the new world in which you live. So for tribal peoples, many felt that the world, without these rituals, without these cycles, the world around us doesn't really exist. It's almost like it it's chaos. It's just chaos and nothingness. And it's quite frightening to think of the world around you as not being completely real. Eliade makes the point that this religious ontology, if you will, ontology means the study of existence, what is real, as opposed to phenomenology, which is the study of what appears to you. Phenomena appear. Ontology is a study of what is really real. Eliade makes the point that these so-called primitive religions have an ontology which is very similar to Plato. If you ever study philosophy and study Plato, Plato had a view of the universe which was sort of like split between the physical world, which he felt was unreal. He felt that the physical world is unreal because it's always changing. You know, there's a mountain here, but over time it will wear away. There's a house here, but it could collapse tomorrow. The physical world is changing always. Your body grows and then gets older and then deteriorates. But he said there was another world, which he called the topos noetos, the place of uh, mind, of ideas, the place of ideas, which was the real world. And the things in this world are only real insofar as they participate or reflect the original items in that topos noitos. So for example, according to Plato, there is a chair in the topos noitos, and the chair has all the elements of chairness, everything that makes a chair. It's good to sit on, it's sturdy, it's comfortable, it holds you up when you sit. And chairs in this world, whatever their shape or form is, they are simply reflections, sort of a, yeah, reflections or shadows of the original chair. And so we need to understand things, in order to understand things, we need to understand what the original form is, what it means. If you study philosophy, you'll find out that his disciple Aristotle disagreed with him. Aristotle said that the only forms that exist are in matter itself. So there's no form without substance, no form without matter. Whereas Plato felt that matter was amorphous and only had form because of these original forms. Anyway, Eliade makes the point that these primal or indigenous religions are very much the same sort of ontology. That they believe that the original creation by the god or gods is what makes this world real. And if we want to live in a real world, we need to reenact periodically the creation stories and myths and events which made this world. And as I said, that renews the time, the cycle of time in which we're living. It also renews the world in which we're living. That's why life cycle rituals and rites, births and coming of age rites and other things are very important because they're not just commemorating a certain passage of time, they're commemorating are participating in the way the world is structured. So Eliade makes the point that for indigenous religions, 
the people see this world as much more sacred than modern day people do. But also he, he emphasizes the concept of hierophany, H I E R uh, O P H A N Y. Hierophany means the a revelation of the divine or the spirit world, something supernatural. The theophany means the revelation of, of God. Hierophany means the revelation of, of a supernatural something. It could be anything. But the point is that the, these hierophanies are what give order and and meaning and solidity to the world in which we live. He felt that this was very important to understand in terms of how tribal people around the world think about their life. It's very important to understand that without the existence or the appearance of some sort of divine event, the world around us has no meaning. And it's terrifying. It would be terrifying to people to feel that the world around them is just pure chaos. Today, if you study physics, you'll find that most Many contemporary people believe that the world is just chaotic. Everything is just random chance. That that defies science, actually, because the whole the whole of science is based upon the idea of cause and effect, that we can ascertain certain things which are true, and we can discern if something happens, you look for the cause. Why did this thing happen? But still, there's a certain kind of what I would call nihilism. Nihilism means uh, denying the meaning of existence. There's a certain kind of nihilism in the modern worldview, which is unfortunate because when we think about science, we, we realize to be truly scientific, you have to believe that there is cause and effect and there are reasons for things that happen. And for indigenous peoples, their religion says, yes, there's a cause. The cause is the God or the gods or the spirits which appear to us and announce things or reveal things to us and those revelations are what makes our life meaningful and real and solid. So the spiritual nature of life, this, the supernatural nature of life to tribal human beings was not otherworldly and, you know, like mystical so much as it was the real, the real reality. It may be mystical, but it's, it defines reality. So for indigenous religions, Myths are not just legends or stories. They describe what actually happened at the beginning. These religions really emphasize origins. The origin is what makes something real. And when there's a hierophany or a revelation of something, that is what's making our life real. So it's very important to understand that the first appearance of anything, the first cloud, the first dog, the first whatever that God's created, that was the real thing. And we need to repeat or re reenact these creation events in order to continue to make our world solid and real. What's interesting to note is that Western religions, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, have broken with this tradition of the cyclical view of history and time and sacred things and Judaism and Christianity Islam believe that time is linear that God did create the universe at the beginning and God created people for a specific purpose and we have a specific individual purpose that God has given us and we have a goal we are heading toward a certain conclusion of history so in Judeo Christianity and Islam the idea of a return to the original primordial event is not done every year but it's enacted at the end of history so the idea of, a, of the coming of Christ or the second coming or the apocalypse that in Judeo-Christian theology is in some ways equivalent to the idea of this eternal return we are going to return to the origin but only at the end of history after long period, intervening period. I will say that if you look at the way we act, you know, celebrating Christmas and Easter and Halloween and New Year's, in some ways, 
you know, sort of on a subliminal level, we are reenacting the creation, or reenacting both well, the death and resurrection of Jesus. We're, we are reenacting certain events which give meaning to our life now, but it will give more meaning at the end of history. So, again, to understand these tribal or indigenous religions, we need to understand their emphasis on sacred time and sacred space. So they don't have necessarily, well, in China, you have traditional religions which may be associated with local temples or something, but most of the time, the sacred spaces could be anything that your family or your tribe designates as sacred. So it's not so much a question of belonging to a belief, but belonging to a social group, belonging to this group which has these particular um, beliefs and rituals. Interestingly enough, one of the largest indigenous religious groups in the world is the Chinese traditional religion, which has over 300 billion adherents. And if you watch even cartoon movies where you see people worshiping dragons and stuff like this, this is somewhat related to the Chinese traditional religion, the idea of veneration for spirits and ancestors. The Chinese traditional religion also has a reverence for what's called Tian, T-I-A-N, or the, the ultimate creator God, and Qi, or Qi, which is the energy which infuses the universe. And also, there's a concept of moral reciprocity, which you might call the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. The reason why Chinese folk religion is somewhat different is because it's sort of like an empty vessel. You can fill it with anything. So much of Chinese folk religion is combined with Buddhism, Confucianism, and Taoism. So you'll have practices which incorporate three or four different religious elements in them. I think the most important thing to realize is that these religions stress the harmony of human beings with the environment around them. That's something that modern people, we could really learn from this because as a result of the growth of industry, I mean, people are learning now, but a hundred years ago, there was no thought about restraining industrial, you know, the side effects of bad industry. Industries were horrible at polluting rivers and lakes and streams and the air. They still do to some extent, but at least we're aware of it, and there are laws against it. But it's important to not just want to restrict pollution, but we. my personal belief is we need to get back to a reverence for the world around us, the creation for nature, for animals and plants, and really have a love for the world in which we live. If we don't love where we live, we won't take care of it. You know, it's just like in a city or anything. If the people love their neighborhood, if they love the block in which they live, they'll make sure it's clean. They'll make sure the streets are swept and not filled with garbage. If you don't love it, then what's to stop everybody from just polluting? It's very important that we learn to love and cherish the environment around us wherever we live. I mentioned a few minutes ago the idea of life cycle rituals. One of the most important life cycle rituals in many tribes is the coming of age vision quest or dream quest. A young man, or in some cases a young woman, when they reach sort of puberty, they will go into a a room or a cavern or something and they will fast, they will pray, they may take certain hallucinogenic drugs and they will stay there until they have a, a certain important dream or vision which is meant to guide them through their life. Uh, and this is very important ritual for many indigenous religions around the world. And connected to that is the concept of the shaman. A shaman is a, a person who has 
a more immediate connection to the realm of the gods and the spirits. A shaman, either through taking certain hallucinogenic drugs or through just fasting or through their just spiritual senses, can connect to this other plane and can give people guidance about what's happening, what's going to happen. If there's a problem in a family or if someone's sick or there's, you know, how do you get rid of it? What do you do? People will go to the shaman to seek advice. That's why in the West, people oftentimes refer to shamans as um, medicine men or something like that. But that's really kind of not exactly, it's only partially correct. Yes, the shaman may be involved in healing, but they're also involved with a lot of other things in guiding. They're sort of like a priest, a psychologist, psychoanalyst, helping people to deal with their everyday problems. In addition to helping people deal with their everyday problems, shamans will also help people to um, overcome their problems which ref are a result of violating some taboo. Now a taboo in the West here we believe that a taboo is, oh that's a bad thing, don't do it, it's a taboo. But a taboo in, in indigenous religions means something which you shouldn't do because it will hurt you. Uh, it could be for example, if there's a sacred tree or a sacred rock, if you disrespect that tree, if you hurt it, if you injure it, or you, you know, you, you dump junk on a sacred ground, this is a taboo. And if there are spirits there who get angry at you, it could cause a lot of trouble for you. So the shaman is the one who will investigate, try to contact the spiritual realm and find out what happened, what's wrong, what needs to be done to change this. Uh, I, I saw recently a, a video on um, marriages in India <laughs> and there was this one guy and the marriages are generally as among the upper class especially are arranged by a woman who knows how to arrange marriages and there was young one young man who was, seemed very prosperous and nice guy but he was having trouble finding a wife and then he went to a kind of Indian shaman who said well you have a problem in your ancestry uh, you have to do certain rituals which will get rid of the problem. So he did it. And the result was then shortly thereafter he was able to find a, a nice bride. So shamans don't just heal people, but they also help protect their tribe from violations of certain taboos. And again, taboos are not there just like naughty, naughty, naughty. Sh taboos are there because if you violate something which is really important, it will it will affect the spirit realm. They will be very angry. They could be very angry at you. You want to avoid that. So if you violate the, the sacred tree, you have to make amends somehow. So many times you make a sacrifice or you'll take make a libation, you know, a drink or some sort of milk or or a wine or something you pour out on the tree to allow the, the spirits to be uh, assuaged, you know, like their anger to be taken care of. These are things which shaman, shamans take care of. They also, to accomplish their tasks, will involve themselves in trances through, I said, use, use of hallucinogenic drugs or through fasting or all kinds of different things. They will get themselves to a point where they can immediately contact the non-physical, the spiritual realm. These are just some of the things that occur uh, in the study, or well, you'll find in the study of indigenous religions. I, I find it quite interesting and I think it's important to realize that for people who live in this kind of society this is very this is very real to them. I heard a story from a, a professor of religion at Harvard. He was a visiting professor from Nigeria and he said that in his country the, the, the UN had come they wanted to build a school in this certain area, and it was a very nice place for it, but there was a tree in the middle of it. They wanted to take the tree down because they, they, they wanted to take the tree out so they could put the school there. And they said, oh, we'll just take, take a bulldozer, we'll wrap a train around the tree and just pull it out. It's not that big a tree, we'll just pull it out. And so they tried, but no matter how much they tried, the tree didn't budge. And this is ridiculous, the tree is not that big. I mean, it's, we could just pull it out. But it wouldn't, it wouldn't come out. He said, finally, they, the, the local shaman came along and said, you can't take the tree. It's the sacred tree of our village. 
if you want to remove it, you have to make a supplication to the to the spirits that are in the tree. Explain to them why you want to move the tree, why this is important for the village, and then you need to find another tree that they can move to. And so they did this. They did a, a special ceremony, offering libations and other offerings to the spirits in the tree, explained to them why they wanted the tree moved and that they could move to another tree nearby, which was a very nice tree. And they would then use this place to build a school for the village. And after they had done this, when they took the bulldozer, the tree popped right out. Now, I don't know if you believe it, but this was told to me by a very prestigious professor of religion at Harvard University who was visiting from Nigeria. So for people who live in tribal societies, they really, most of the people take these aspects of religion very seriously. And so it's very important, I think, if you want to study religion, to try, as I said at the very beginning in my previous video, try to understand what it's like for people who live in this situation. I think for modern people, the idea of spirits and ancestors intervening is very odd. It's, it's not something we get, come, get involved with too often, but for many people around the world, millions and millions of people around the world, this is a fundamental reality of their life. So this is my personal introduction to the study of religion. It's not meant to be exhaustive. It's meant to be sort of an overview, just looking at certain things which I think are interesting and important. And I hope you will have gained something from this lecture. Thank you. Have a good day.